Today I want to talk to you about Paul's final words. Paul's final words. You have an outline and a bulletin you can go along with us. Number one, the people to note. The people to note. Number two, the people Paul loved. The people Paul loved. And number three, the prophetic word. The prophetic word. And uh, that is so, so important uh, in this. You know, the book of Romans ends with a beautiful doxology, praising God for what he has done through his son, Jesus Christ. It also has a list of people who were dear to Paul in his ministry, leaders in the church that he founded, and those who helped him in his missionary journeys. Paul also issues a strong warning about people who speak against God's holy word and the doctrines of the church. His writing about these false teachers was because of the love he had for the churches he had founded and the Christian friends he had made throughout the years. The book of Romans was truly one of the greatest books in the Bible because of, because of the purest explanation of the doctrine of salvation. It has been an honor to teach this awesome book. Romans chapter 16, verse 1. And uh, we're, we're not going to read the first uh, 16 verses. Uh, I just want to mention Phoebe there. Uh, you know, he, he mentions that. Uh, and also in verse 3, Priscilla and Aquila, uh, they were very near to, to Paul. Uh, they, you know, followed him. Uh, they were major supporters of his, of his ministry. And then we have a bunch of verses with a bunch of names, uh, which I cannot pronounce, and I'm not going to go all the way through those, uh, because they, they really were minor things in his life. And uh, verse 16, I do want to point out, greet one another with a holy kiss. I've got to tell this story. When I first went to Alma, Arkansas, as an associate pastor, uh, we'd go occasionally to this pastor's prayer group. And Brother Bob Shelton uh, told me he wanted me to come one day. And he said, I want you to meet somebody, a friend of mine. And anyway, little did I know that what he really was doing was setting me up for something. Okay, you just have to know Bob. And uh, so we get at this gathering. It had not started yet. And this older gentleman come up to me and introduced himself. And he said, I hear you're the new associate pastor at First Baptist Church of Alma. And then he came at me, and I thought, what is he doing? And he kissed me on my left cheek. He kissed me on my right cheek. And Bob Shelton was behind me laughing so hard because this is the way. And, and I learned this. I got used to it because that's the way he greeted all folks. All right? Now, here's what I'm saying. I don't want you to kiss me, Okay. <laughs> And I'm especially uncomfortable either way, guys or girls, okay? <laughs> I'll hug you and I'll shake your hand, all right? But that's not what it's saying. Don't be smooching on one another, okay? That was the greeting of that day, all right? So please uh, respect people's uh, areas, the, the, their, their area there. Now, let's go on to verse 17. I just had to clear the air about that. Verse 17, now I urge you, brethren, make note of those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learn and avoid them. And you have to understand a person's last words are very important. Someone on a dying bed that is still conscious and is still speaking and coherent, all right, they, they'll say something dear usually to their family. And Paul, in this final, you will see three times he uses the word, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ three times, and, it, and then it says, amen, which literally means so be it. So he's prefacing this with, I'm going to start out with the bad news, okay? These are folks you need to avoid. These are folks that you don't need to have fellowship with. These are folks that you don't need to argue with. See, some people just want to argue about the Word of God. And here's what I found out. I found out that I probably am not going to change some people's minds. For instance, I've done this, I know, three times 
since I've been in Fort Smith. Somebody comes, and usually it's a pair. Sometimes they are in white shirts and have a tie, and they come and knock on my door, and they say, we, we have some material we want to give you. And so I really, really, and he says, can we come in and share some things with you? And here's what I say, standing in my door. If you will give me 20 minutes, if you're taking 20 minutes of my time, if you'll give me 20 minutes of yours, then you'll be welcomed into my house. No, no, okay, we just want you to have this material. And they take it and they walk off. Why? Because they're intimidated by that. And folks, we, we have a right to defend the gospel, okay, not in an angry way. It is not right to get mad at people when we're talking about the Bible. Folks, some people just don't know the Bible. Some people have been deceived about the Word of God. That's why it's so important that you know the Word of God, that you know what the Bible says. You know what you believe. You know. And here, as a matter of fact, there were three churches that he really pointed out, uh, the church in Galatia, the church in Philippi, and the church in Corinth, all had false teachers that Paul had to address. Okay? And there are false teachers that are on every television station. Not every, I'm just saying they're on television. And you have to realize, all you have to do is pay for airtime. They don't quiz you and ask you about your doctorate. If you got the money, you can get on and you can say anything. I remember uh, when I was a youth minister, uh, they, my kids are come to me and they were telling me, hey, you got to watch this guy. And I said, when is it? He, he starts at midnight. And I'm like, I'm not watching a, a sermon at midnight, all right? And he says, what he does is he sits at a desk, he's smoking a cigar, and he's cussing. And I'm like, are you serious? And I said, you record it for me, and I want to see it. And I'm telling you, that was exactly what he was doing. I was floored by that, by his actions. So don't think that just because somebody puts a suit on and has a Bible in his hands are true prophets of God or, or true teachers of God's Word. Paul, Paul is getting serious here. This is serious stuff here. He said, I urge you, take note of them, mark them, because they cause division and offenses. Folks, Satan wants to divide every church. Satan wants to divide every church. He says, avoid them. He did not say be rude to them. He said, just avoid them. All right? Then he says, for those who are such, do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech, speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Do you know who these folks prey on most of all? New Christians. People that had not grown up in church. People that want a following. Folks, uh, I understand numbers, and, and you know, there's a book in the Bible named Numbers. So numbers are important. But I am telling you, Numbers are not everything, okay? We need to follow a person that is teaching the Word of God, living the Word of God. Some pastors' lives don't add up to what the Word of God said, as I said of this pastor that I had literally seen. And folks, I'm talking, this was 30-something years ago. But I'm still saying it's wrong. It's wrong. Matter of fact, Matthew chapter 7. Go with me to Matthew 7. Matthew 7. Matthew 7. The Bible says, Beware of false prophets. This is Jesus' words, all right? Who come to you in sheep's clothing. They look good on the outside. They talk it. Uh, they may even put the word reverend before their name. And by the way, I'm not real comfortable with reverend either. Okay, I, I don't feel like I'm reverent enough to be called reverend. All right, just call me Brother Mike. I, I, I just, Brother Mike is fine. Or call me pastor. A lot of people just call me pastor. I don't mind that at all. But inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. That means they are hunting people, folks. They're looking for people to deceive. They want to impress you with their numbers or, or possibly what they have or or their money, or, or their popularity. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? 
Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Folks, if I pl plant an apple tree in my backyard and put apple seeds in the ground, there's going to be apples comes up. And the same thing is true with the Word of God. If we put the pure Word of God in the ground, if we are growing a tree, I am telling you, good fruit will come up. But if I'm giving you my opinion, if I'm teaching things contrary to the Word of God, and I will say this, if I hear and you come to me and say, my teacher is teaching false doctrine, then me and that person is going to have a conversation. Okay? We need purity of the doctrine. Now again, I will say this warning also. I'm fixing to go into Revelation, and sometimes the interpretation of some people is different than interpretation of others. All right? Premillennialist, amillennialist, and postmillennialist. My, my father was an amillennialist. I'm a premillennialist. Okay? That doesn't mean I'm teaching false uh, scripture. It simply means, and you will hear me say this a lot in Revelation, in my opinion, because I've read commentaries on Revelation, and I'm telling you people that I trust, Warren Wiersbe is a man that I trust, John MacArthur is another man that I trust, and they will say the actual ex opposites on certain parts. One will say this is the way it is, and the other one will say this is the way it is. And folks, you have to let the Holy Spirit speak to you, all right? And that's what I do Saturday nights from 6 to 9 o'clock. I don't have a commentary anywhere. I just have the Word of God. I have my sermon, and I go over it over it again two times, and I say, God, help me to speak only what you want me to say. So good fruit and bad fruit. Uh, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, Therefore, by the fruits, you will know them. And by the way, uh, he, they may get away with it here on earth. They may be a false prophet. And I'm telling you, if they're not saved, they will be taken down when all is said and done. I think that's why Jesus wrote, uh, just because you call me Lord, Lord, doesn't make you a Christian. Okay? Just because you give me your list of spiritual things doesn't make you a Christian. Do you know Jesus Christ? as your personal Lord and Savior? Is the Holy Spirit inside of you? And I'll tell you this thing about false doctrine. What we need to pray is for two things. Number one, wisdom. Wisdom, knowing God's Word. Knowing God's Word, knowing God's mind, knowing how He thinks. We need to pray for wisdom, and we need to pray for discernment. Folks, I am telling you, I can turn a TV on and go to the religious channel. I can watch somebody for less than five minutes, and I can tell you whether you need to be listening to that person or not. God has given me the gift of discernment, and it doesn't take me long to figure it out. And as you grow in the Lord, that discernment and that wisdom will help you on these issues. So it tells us, beware of false teachers. They deceive what, what is deception? Folks, it's lies. Jesus called Satan the father of lies. Look at verse 19. For your obedience has become known to all, therefore I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. I spoke to you about wisdom. We will see the word discernment here in just a few minutes. But it's saying, because I heard, a youth pastor when I was young, I don't know why today, Marty, I'm, I'm giving some youth examples, but I heard a youth pastor tell me this. Here's what he said. I'm taking my kids to a KISS concert. Okay, now I'm dating myself again, folks. But when I look at KISS and their dress, I'm thinking, I don't want my teenagers even looking. And here's what he said. I think they have to experience sin to realize that they, 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 uh, have Christ, and they know. So are you going to take them into a bar and watch people get drunk? I'm serious, folks. Be halfway smart about what we're doing. And I'll tell you where Satan has got us. He is getting us through social media. He has got us hook, line, and you. There are people that are married to their phones. Married to them. They can't wake up without looking at it first. 
The last thing they do is when they go to sleep with it. And you think about all the junk and the trash. Listen to me. Teenage parents, you need to filter. You need to know what your kids are listening to. You need to know what sites they're on. It's deception. It's lies of Satan. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, man, you need to be close to God so that you have, will have this discernment in your life. And by the way, not just at your house, but you need to know who their friends are. They may be getting pornography at someone else's house. Know your kids. Verse 20, and the peace of God will crush Satan under your feet shortly. What is Paul saying? They're going to be found out. They're going to stand before God. You know what it is? When you think of standing under your feet, it's uh, the battle cry. It's, it's when, like, you capture a king and you, you literally put your foot on his throat, and then, and then you take him out. You say, man, that's harsh. Hey, folks, in the Old Testament, that's just the way it was then. That's the way it was. And, and so he's basically saying, Satan is behind all this, and one day God's going to crush Satan. I can't wait for the battle of Armageddon. I can't wait to see him fired up. You think people get fired up. I'm telling you, he's coming back. He's cleaning the house, and he is going to destroy all those countries and all those leaders. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, go with me to Matthew 16. Matthew 16, verse 13. And Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So he said to them, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What was Peter saying? Folks, he was quoting the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are God in human flesh. You are alive. Folks, the God that we serve is not a statue on a mantle. It's not made of gold or silver. It's the God who wrote the word of God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. See, some you know, people interpret that is the church is built on Peter, but it's not, folks. The church is built on God, the solid rock. The church is built on Jesus Christ who gave himself for it. Now look at the next. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Oh, folks, I've read the end of the book. I've read Revelation, and we win. We win. I am telling you, Satan will be a defeated foe. Satan will be thrown into hell for the last time to live forever and ever and ever with all his family. So I'm, I'm telling you, Paul just kind of starts it out here, this doxology of let's get the hard stuff out of the way first. Let's make sure you understand this. And then his his deal that I read before the verse, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Number two, the people to note, the people Paul loved, and he started with Timothy, my fellow worker. Paul called Timothy his son in the ministry. Paul had adopted him, and I don't know legally that he did, but he really, I mean, Timothy was a, a, was a mentor. Paul was his mentor. And when Paul uh, you know, was getting close to realizing his days were there. I believe he just passed the mantle on to Timothy. And then he says, Lucius, Jason, and so, so Peter also, my countrymen greet you. There's not a lot known other than these were Jewish friends that helped him on his missionaries' journeys. Tertullus, and uh, this was Paul's secretary or his writer. I believe when Paul spoke of that thorn in the flesh, 
I believe Paul at the end of his life was going blind. I believe he could not see. And so I think this was his writer. Uh, but notice even in this, Paul will sign and he will do uh, one little, a, a couple of sentences here. And that would be to authenticate that it was Paul who wrote this book through the, uh, through the Holy Spirit. So this was, you know, his, his friend, his, his writer, and someone he depended on a lot, especially later in life. Then you have Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church. Uh, obviously, Paul stayed in his home, and a house church met there, and uh, he, he thought very highly of him. Greet you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. And again, this was a convert from Corinth, okay? And, and folks, I, I've said it before, we need, we need Christians in the government, okay? We need Christians that want to make the, the right laws and that stand for Christ. And so we see uh, that they're uh, Erastus. And then it says, in Cortus, a brother, and Cortus was a, another brother of Christ, uh, and I believe most of these Paul personally led to the Lord. And it says, in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, amen. So you see that same thing twice. Now look at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1. He's introducing this to the Philippian church, but I mean, you get this sense to all the churches that he started. Okay? Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. Grace to you and peace uh, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God on every remembrance of you. Man, Paul just wanted to thank these guys personally for what they had done for him. Always in prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. Folks, Paul was a man of prayer. And I cannot tell you how important prayer is, folks. It is so important so important that we pray for our brothers and our sisters in Christ, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day to now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Do you realize we all are a work in progress? God's still working on us. God is still shaping us. God is still molding us. We have not arrived spiritually. There is nobody in this building that can stand up and say, I have no sin, I am perfect now. There's nobody. Matter of fact, if you stood up and said that, I think I'd go back a few steps just in case God decides to do something. We are all a work in progress. And I told you last week about Paul. I know of two mistakes I feel like he made, all right? Not judging him, I'm just saying, my spirit just said he shouldn't have done these two things. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both my chains and defense and confirmation of the uh, gospel, you are all partakers with me of this grace. And you know what it means to have someone in your heart? And by the way, guys, Valentine's Day is Tuesday. Can I help you with this? Don't forget. All right? Don't forget. It's not worth it. All right? And another thing, guys, don't be cheap. Okay? Some of you are, you go to the Dollar General store, and I'm not, I'm not picking on them. I'm simply saying, show them you love them. All right? All right? Burger King is not the place you need to go, okay? But what Paul is saying, Paul is saying, you're on my mind all the time. Folks, when you love someone, they're always on your mind. I got accused one time of calling Lori when we were dating 12 times in one day. Now, I remember five or six, but Lori counts better than I do. Why? Because I wanted to talk to her. Okay, and Paul is saying, man, when I look back in my ministry, I just think of you guys. I get a smile on my face. Folks, I don't know about you, but 
I'm 64 years old, and, and now things are different. I see things different. The things that were important to me even 10 years ago are not that important to me anymore. And to think of people that, you know, I've been in three ministries and in three churches, and I see people that help me through the ministry. I mean, I told you last week, I've been 19 years here, and folks, I couldn't do what I do without people in the ministry. And, and people encourage me, and people writing me notes, and people just uh, sharing in my ministry. And that's what, pa that's what Paul is saying. And it says, For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you with all the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in all knowledge and discernment. He's saying, man, knowledge is information, and information is the Word of God. We need to keep growing, keep growing, keep glowing, keep serving, keep uh, discerning is what he is saying, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense unto the day of Christ. He did not say be perfect, because I've already covered that. We're not perfect. But man, when you sin, you admit it. You say, God, I'm wrong. I was wrong. God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and to the praise of God. So we see the people to note. We see the people Paul loved. And I want you to see the prophetic word. The prophetic word back in our scripture. Verse 25, and the headline in there is benediction. This is his closing. Now to him who is able, folks, we know who is able. Our God is able to establish you according to my gospel in the preaching of Jesus Christ. And that word my caught my attention. Because if you really think about it, it's not Paul's gospel. Whose gospel is it? It's God's gospel. It's Jesus' gospel. But he is simply saying, what I have taught you is what comes from the Word of God. What I have penned is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why, Phil, I loved what you said, what you're saying, because it's the cross. Everything about us is the cross. It is Jesus Christ. It's, it's not a presentation it's not a memorization thing. Man, we need to preach Jesus Christ and the cross according to the revelation. And we have revelation. That's when God teaches us something. That, that's when something comes to light. That's when you read a scripture and you think, oh, wow, that is cool. That is awesome. The revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. And it almost sounds like mystery. We always see is, you know, that you're hiding something. You know, that person is, you know, man, he's a mystery. All right? <laughs> I love sports, and I, I watch Get Up quite a bit, I will say that. And when I think of life being a mystery, I think of Aaron Rodgers. And, you know, they just look for quotes from him. And here's what he said this week. He said, contemplating his playing next year or not, I'm going to four days of darkness and then just turned and walked away. And I'm sitting there looking at that and thinking about that and pondering that. And I'm thinking, you know what? I don't want to go to four days of darkness. I want to go to four days of light. You see, and this stuff on philosophy... You know, I was out at the Wildlife Refuge one day with a friend of mine, and we were chunking rocks into a creek. And this hiker comes by, and he said, can I talk to you boys? I said, sure. He said, if everyone that came by here threw a rock in the creek, there wouldn't be a creek. Folks, I thought, I was probably 15, 16 years old, and I, I had to ponder that. I thought, 
He's right. So I quit throwing rocks in creeks. All right? But God is not that way. God doesn't say, you try to read the Bible and maybe you could figure it out. Okay, that's not what he's... God is not hiding. What he's really saying when he talks to the prophets is, they did not have what we have. We have a full copy of the Word of God. And in Paul's day, I'm just telling you, they were hard to come by. Matter of fact, what they would do at first, they would take one book and they would go and they would share it with that church there and they would have to read that you know and and study that and then they'd have to take that copy of what Paul wrote to another church and share it that way there weren't printing presses back then everything had to be handwritten so he's just simply saying we live in a time of the gospel we live in a time of, of grace If you are here today and you don't have Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have every right, if the Holy Spirit says, come, to come and walk down this aisle and get saved. That is free grace. But you can't do that in all countries, folks. You can't carry a Bible in some countries. You can't use the name of Jesus in some countries. We are blessed to be enlightened by God. He has given us his spirit. And look what it says, kept to the mystery, but now manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God. Folks, I can't tell you. Is Lonnie in here? How many, how many nations? How many, the Gideon Bibles, does anybody know the exact Okay, over 200 and over 223. Scott, have you heard anything? No, well, actually, translate Bibles and languages. Okay, bi- okay, let's go with 225. Okay, and folks, I am telling you, we were in Mexico City doing a Jesus film years ago when I was I first went is right after I went to Alma, and we were showing this Jesus film in Mexico City. And we were just, you know, kind of playing with the kids, trying to keep them calm and do stuff. But when it came to the cross, I am telling you, I, this lady just started screaming and she was speaking in Spanish. And so, you know, even though I'm half Hispanic, I had no clue what she was saying. And so I got an interpreter and I said, man, what's she saying? She was saying, stop the film, stop the film. He doesn't deserve to die. And I'm telling you, tears just flow down my face. Okay? Folks, people are dying to hear the gospel. And that's what Paul is saying. And we need to support the Gideons. And we do. Over 10,000 languages. And folks, we're not through. We're not through. We have to. And that's what Paul's saying. Man, the Scripture is what it's about. It's not about a lecture. It's not just about a sermon. It's about the divine Word of God. 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3. Verse 14. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and being assured of, knowing from whom you have learned then. And from the childhood, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. Folks, there's two things that have to happen for you to be saved. Number one, you ha- someone has to share scripture with you. You have to have scripture. And the second thing is, the Holy Spirit has to prick your heart, has to con- you know, convict you of sin. If those two things are there, you can be saved. Now here it is. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Oh, folks, the Word of God 
is salvation. We've got to take it seriously. We need to know the Roman road. We need to be able to share this when God gives us opportunity to do that. It is so, so important. The Word of God is yes. It is amen. It's where we find our doctrine, and it's where we find instructions in every phase of life. And then 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1. I close with this. Verse 16. For we did not follow cunning, uh, cunning device fables when we were made known to you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. I will say Satan did his best to have me not be here today. Yesterday, I'm just telling you, I just cough, 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 cough. And I did test. I don't have COVID. Okay, it's cool. but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son who I am well pleased. What was that at? Jesus' baptism. Folks, if you've made a profession of faith and haven't been baptized, you really need to do that. You really do. It, it's Scripture, folks. It is Scripture. And it says, and we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And now he's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. Okay, read that, man. Man, that was some awesome stuff. And so we have the prophetic word confirm, which you do well to heed as light that shines in a dark place. Folks, we're living in darkness now. This world is dark, and we need the light of the gospel out there until the day dawns and the morning star arises in our hearts knowing first that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation for prophecy never came by the will of man but holy men of god who spoke as they were moved by the holy spirit you know what you need to do man you need to stay in love with god stay in love with god you need to make Bible reading, a priority in your life. How do we know what's wrong? By knowing what's right. And we need, you need some systematic way of reading God's Word every day, and I promise you, you will grow in the Lord. So bottom line to everything I'm saying, in the last book of Romans, in the last part of Romans, what what is Jesus saying to us? Look at the last part. I didn't finish it there. Let me. Verse 27, to God alone, be wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. The most, no, the, let me put it this way. The absolute most important thing in life is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God to salvation. And Paul at the first Romans 1 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can get a lot of good gifts in your lifetime. You can give great gifts in your lifetime, but the greatest gift you can give anyone is the gift of the gospel. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for the gospel. I thank you for the book of Romans. God, it was just an awesome book to teach and to study. And God, I pray if there's one here today that doesn't know you, that today would be their day of salvation. And God, I just pray, Lord, that you would just work in our hearts and work in our lives. God, you are the gospel. And God, I pray for Christians especially. Lord, if there's Christians here that just need to come to this altar and pray, and maybe they have someone lost and they have a burden for somebody, I pray that they would come to this altar and just pray for that person. And God, I pray if they need to rededicate their life, that they would just talk to one of us and let us pray with them. And Lord, those who have made professions and have not followed up in baptism, God, I pray that they would just do that soon. Lord, I just showed them in Scripture what Jesus has said. 
this is my beloved son who I'm well pleased. And God, I pray also if there's here folks here that need to join this church, if they come three Sundays, they know who we are. They know what we're about. We're about God. We're about Jesus. And we're about the word of God. We will teach it. We will believe it. We will live it to, to the fullest. So God, this is your invitation. This is your church. I pray you do with it what you choose. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God is speaking to you in any way, would you come?